But there are passages, and right in that beginning with Rat, you know, where, where you see him at the train yard and his VO starts coming in, it's total, you, you, know, what, you, you know what it is? It's dirtbag Terrence Malick. It's dirtbag Malick is what I'm calling it. <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome to one fucking hour. Uh, I'm Evan Husney, uh, joined, of course. But hey, we got uh, three others today, so it's a special show. Uh, first off, though, to my left, we have Tom Fitzgerald. Tommy boy. Hello, everyone. The man on the left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, right, right. Uh, to my left. right, though, is uh, Marcus Herring. Marcus, welcome back. Stage, stage left, though. Mm-hmm. Right. And who's left, Evan? I'm to, to, to announce. Uh, I mean, to my right is uh, our special guest, uh, returning, right, yeah. returning from mm-hmm. the very successful, our most successful show, returning champion. Yeah, returning champion from our most successful episode, which was Star Eighty. Is uh, welcome, Ramy. Oh, yeah. Welcome back, Ramy. How's it going? Thank you, Evan. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Happy yeah. To be here. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. So you, uh, you just show up for the uh, crushing bummers. You know what's so funny? I was, I was going to actually say that. I'm like, I'm just going to come for the most harrowing, you know, I mean, really. fucking pitch black. Like Spinal Tap? No. Right. no, no. Get out of here. <laughs> <Like that>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cracking up? No. Yeah. Um, Boring. Yeah. yeah. Moment. True. Very true. All right. But uh, what I will say is this fucking hour uh, is on... The 1984 documentary Streetwise, which all four of us uh, are big fans of. Um, So let's get into it. I'm going to start that fucking clock, guys. By the way, episode 26, one fucking hour on Streetwise, clock beginning. Here we uh, go. Okay. All right, everybody. Streetwise is the 1984 documentary, as I said, uh, directed by Martin Bell, who is the only one who is credited as the director but also the movie definitely was made possible by Mary Ellen Mark and Cheryl McCall. Those are the three that I'm crediting for this movie. Um, the film follows uh, teenage runaways living in the streets of Seattle, uh, including the iron-willed 14-year-old Tiny, who would become the project's most haunting and enduring figure, um, yeah. along with the uh, roller skating squatter, Rat. <laughs> and, Rat. Uh, <laughs> and perhaps the film's most tragic figure, the affable drifter Dwayne, um, and who, driven from their broken homes, survive by hustling, panhandling, and dumpster diving. Uh, granted remarkable access to their world, the filmmakers crafted a devastatingly frank, empathetic portrait of lost youth growing up far too soon in a society that has failed them. That is this movie. It is absolutely, for my money, going to start with the hyperbole right off the top. Maybe the best doc of maybe my favorite doc, top doc over here for this guy. It's it's a top for me. Yeah. Uh, just uh, my objective opinion, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, best of the bunch, maybe the '80s, you know, which is saying something. There's some killer deep cuts. Uh, '80s is great to look uh, to pour through with docs too, by the way, because they didn't they didn't have a sexy sizzle, uh, you know, mostly. You know what I mean? Um, and that's yeah. uh, definitely a lot of a new ground. Where, a lot of new ground was broken yeah. in the eighties with Doc, for sure. Yeah, we had and, and, Sherman's March is that? <coughs> yeah, that's it is. Yeah, right. Thin Blue Line. Absolutely. And there, yeah. well, I was gonna say, and even Errol Morris earlier with uh, Gates of Heaven, and then, um, and, and then of mm. course the Streetwise. And I, I just want to give a shout out to my boys, uh, E and S, um, E Britton Siskel, uh, S and E. Um, they really were champions of Docs in the eighties, and they certainly helped out. Even me as a little kid, I learned about Gates of Heaven and I learned about Streetwise. That's where I yeah, first heard of it. that's right. And yeah. people, it was so niche. I mean, um, you know, uh, the Harvey Milk film that won an Oscar, it kind of broke through a little bit, but it was Harvey sort of an Milk agenda. Harvey Milk beat this at the Oscars. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, um, wow. But anyway, I'm just saying that uh, people were not paying attention. It got a little sexier at the end of the decade with Roger and me and uh, Errol Morris' is, um, you know, thin blue line. Yeah. And then everything's different. And then we're here today where uh, people are doc crazy, mostly yeah. true crime, but all, all docs. I'm about to watch the Abercrombie and Fitch doc. You know? Whoa. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, dude. Holy shit. Yeah, what a what's weird up? world. Well, let's. What's let's uh, so, um, yeah, let's it's another about... time in docs. And it's only our second doc we're covering. I just wanted to make that 
call. That's true. You know, yeah. Overnight, another groundbreaking. So much. Documentary. Well, and Spinal Tap. That's true. Right, obviously, Spinal. But let's uh, let's get a hard uh, refresh here and talk about the origins now of this movie because it has it, it is rooted in, in heavy journalism, man, and also photography. Uh, two different art forms kind of colliding, you know, uh, with this movie. Yeah. So, uh, Ramey, I know you're. Uh, w- well across the the history of this film, and of course, there's a. It also has a companion book or monograph, yeah. if you will, which yeah, you have. Yeah, so I was right? going to show, show you guys. Yeah, so this is the um, sweet the hold companion it. book. Can you see? Yep, in front of your fa- yeah. Hold it back a little. It's, it's tiny. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's it Good. right there. Yep. Okay. Got um, <laughs> uh, photographs by Mary Ellen Mark. Um, so yeah, so a little bit of just like the background of the origin story of how this film came together. Um, so Mary Ellen Mark uh, was a photojournalist. And w- crazily enough, she actually was the unit set photographer for like over 100 films, including Apocalypse Now, one wow. for the cuckoo's nest. Okay. Whoa. So this is a little, just a little tidbit that kind yeah. of explains how she got into the more photojournalistic route after doing commercial photography. She was on mm-hmm. the set of one flew of the cuckoo's nest and was just like completely fascinated by the mental institution. Whoa. Asked the, you know, people, can you give me a tour? And they, you know, they talked and she was like, listen, I'd love to stay here for a while. And um, she stayed for a good amount of time in the woman's ward of the hospital and basically documented the condition conditions of the women who were yeah. severely mentally ill living in the hospital. And um, and so I think it was inter- interesting because it, it started from like a narrative film and it kind of led her into, yeah. you know, by by exploring a topic like that, how you can know people. And, and, and if I can, that's, it, it, is it not, it's the Pacific Northwest where Cuckoo's Nest was filmed. Right. And then it, this film is set, you know, in Seattle. So yeah. maybe that had some relation, you know, like she's so, stuck around that area. And well, it's, it's also interesting. So she did that and then she ended up um hooking up with a writer um cheryl mccall at life magazine and um they were life magazine was looking to do a piece about homelessness and uh, the crisis of child homelessness in america at the time and so they teamed up cheryl mccall with mary ellen mark mary mary ellen mark would do the photographs and it's funny because tom this is something that you were talking about a little bit earlier before we started recording, they were trying to think, okay, what, what city, right? What city should we examine? And at that time in the national news, so there was an article that came out in Harper's Bazaar that basically proclaimed Seattle to be the best city to live in, in the United Uh, States. So it was like, this is the most livable city, right? Right. Beautiful ports and beautiful scenic views and it's metropolitan and it's good, you know, all this great stuff. Yep. And great coffee. Um, and so they were like, okay, well, that's interesting. What, what about we go to the best, most livable city in the country and see oh, how dire wow. actually the conditions are for, for children yeah. who are runaways. Um, and so it was almost like kind of like turning that on its head because yeah. Seattle, like talking about the sense of place, which makes it so important. It's like in the 80s, Seattle was changing so much. So it was becoming the best place to live for certain types of people, right? Like mm, it was, it used to be a city that like, you know, working class, working poor yeah. could exist in. There was low rent places. It was, you know, it was accessible in that way. And then like- Fishing, the, lumber. Exactly. That's yeah. what drove it. Yeah, exactly. And then that started to change in the 80s and different industries came in. Gentrification started happening, pushed a lot of people out. And then so you see this dynamic where there's, you know, sort of people on the fringes. And so when they went in there, um, they, at first they were like, oh, my God, what a beautiful place. And they're kind of taken by that sort of touristy, you know, veneer. But then right away they they went to, you know, the the, the main drag where the kids are. Right. And Cheryl and uh, Mary Ellen Mark basically kind of just started like acclimating themselves within that community and like talk about method directing how you guys talk about William. Oh Friedman. yeah. And well, I was going to, can I, yeah, these can I, two women did, Yeah. Go for it. But. I was just going to throw one anecdote on that, that really, uh, that I also saw reading in that book. Cause I was, fl- I was thumbing through that book earlier and, um, you know, these kids were very suspect of Mary and Cheryl when they showed up because mm-hmm. they actually thought they were like undercover cops you know, because they were very suspect to them. Like, what's going on with these two? Why are they hanging around so much? So- well, they're streetwise. Well, right, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? And so, but what the the one moment that really won them over in a big way is when Mary got a jaywalking ticket, and then she snapped at a cop and tried to fight it with the cop, and then all the kids saw her arguing with the cop and like, okay, she's right. cool, you know. And then uh, right. and that was really really kind of what set it off. And actually, Lulu did it. Yeah. 
who is, you know, uh, one of the characters in the film, you know, she's a baseball she, cap the whole time. Right. Mm-hmm. She's just picking fights and screaming at people the whole movie. She's a they pimp, actually, too. Yeah, right. Yeah. She's the first one they really connected with. And once Lulu embraced both of them, mm-hmm. then all the kids started to embrace them. But it really speaks to the fact that they just really were uh, incredible with access in, in terms of getting people to trust them. And they were yeah, genuine. I was wondering were, about you know, that. Yeah. And, is there a time frame? If, if you don't mind, it's like to speak to that because I was wondering how much uh, trust building, uh, how much time it would take. Like, is it like we hung out with them for about 30 days or six it was a, months? It was a few months. Um, so three or four months. Yeah, I think it was like about like two or three months to write the article, basically. So yes. just just to write the piece, it was called Streets of the Lost. So they spent about two months with with the kids. That. Then they then they wrote the article, and then the article you know got some publicity. But during that whole experience, Mary Ellen called her husband, who is the you know director Martin Bell, and said like, "Man, you we got to make this into a film. Yeah. Like this has got to be on film." And it was in quick succession. So articles yes. are written and it's like grab yeah. the camera. So it's yeah, mostly it was, the same kids. Like the kids didn't change oh yeah. out. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, there, there was there was a few kids that like had a. There was a few kids that changed out, but it was primarily the same group. Yeah, and, like and Tiny was there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Tiny, Tiny was there. Um, Rat. But then so Cher, Cheryl, because she was had been at Life Magazine for a while, she had some like interesting contacts, and so she. This is very strange, but she ended up calling up Willie Nelson, who was her buddy. And I was he's gonna, the person yeah. who. He funded the film, so he gave. What? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so he was the executive producer oh, and gave eighty thousand dollars. Holy! And fuck. then I was going to say, yeah. then like Billy, tax break or something. Isn't that <laughs> looking for and like tax write-off. Billy Jean King was the other uh, the other financier. What? Yeah. And so yeah. Billy Random. Jean this, and, this is the writer's friends. Like and, that's no, why, no, right? No, yeah. No. No. Well, no. kind uh, of. You say well, Cheryl? Cheryl knew them. Yeah, Cheryl supposedly. Oh, I what I what yeah. Well, what I what I had heard was, and and we can get out of the the behind the scenes of the movie. Yeah. But the idea, but 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 the idea is that you know uh, Mary and her husband, you know uh, uh, Martin Bell, who's who's the director of Streetwise, who's credited as it. Mm. They met on a, another Milos Forman film, Ragtime, so it has more Milos connections. Oh. And 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 so they really right. kind of hit it off, and they started working together on projects. And they wanted to find something. And then it was the confluence of her going out for the Life magazine story, then calling Martin, as R- Rami, you said, and was like, uh, yeah, there's this kid, Rat. He lives in a, you know, a abandoned hotel and he's like roller roller skating down the corridors. We got to like we got to get out here now, you know. And so then they like right, right. so then they got out there. But it was I think they did an interview with Willie Nelson for Life magazine or they did an interview. And it just was one of those organic things where they were like exuberant okay. about the project. Yeah. And then they started telling and about he talked it. To him. They like, talked to him. They talked to give you the money. Sounds amazing. Go ahead, kids. No strings attached. But it was it was really it. Cheryl, just to be clear. It was very it was really Cheryl. Yes, Cheryl. Yeah. Yes. Right. So yeah. she was the one who like went out and was like and she was super active. Like she was the one who was like coordinating with the social workers down there. She was getting kids out of juvie. She was getting the like she was the completely on the ground, like a meshed. So right. yeah, it's the just, runner like, for the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So will, yeah. Can okay. we just real real quick as a as a put a bow on this is maybe let's just look at a few of the photographs that this you know film is sort of based on really um, from Life. I've magazine. never seen the book. Oh man! So obviously, like you know, uh, check this out. You know, obviously, Tiny, one of the main uh, characters of Streetwise, and and this is this was taken during the that Life kind of magazine. A, that kind version. of a Joan Jett thing going there. Totally, yeah. totally, a hundred percent. And you know, she's such just an amazing character in the film, and we should. And it's hard. Totally, yeah, hundred percent. And you know these photos here, are just you know, really just great, amazing, great stuff. photos. Yeah, Killer. totally. Uh, I gotta get this book. I mean, yeah. and this character shows up in the movie too. Just, a, a, a just little little side like shots on the street. The yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, it's amazing stuff. Uh, great. And of, of course, you know, got wow. love rat, rat in the gap. Yeah. Who, who's dude on the right? I've seen that's like the poster <laughs> a lot of times. Like, what's know. going on there? <laughs> you yeah. know. And uh, but um, Tom. Yeah. Boom. Hit me. So. Boombox 83, baby. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Times two. Yeah. Man, so. even cool the white kids were rocking with boomboxes. So cool. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's just the backstory, I think it touches on just two of the elements that really make this doc like a cut above. You know, like just the fact that it's done by photographers. Like it's so apparent that they're photographers. I mean, it's like it's so beautiful to look at. Like their eyes. You know, it's so confident. You know, the camera works so confident. 
they always seem to know like the best way to shoot something. I know. Like, it seems sort of like innately shooting it from the best angle, like every single time. Like if it's an alleyway shot, they like they, they go de- below the eye line and all those kind of mm-hmm. things, those little nuances. I know. And well, you know there's what's a, a lot of oh, like oh go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know what's also a crazy detail about the craft of what they did, like and how they cause because they obviously knew like we're not gonna do interviews, like traditional sit down interviews like a documentary would obviously talking head stuff yeah right Mm -hmm. but they had the foresight and this is an underappreciated detail that i just caught listening to the idol commentary earlier today was the idea that they um they they knew sound was going to be tricky on the film in terms of the streets and everything that they were going to do so they lobbed all these kids so all the kids are actually wearing lavalier mics you know which is genius which is amazing And, and the kids got so used to Putting on oh, their I'm own sure lobs. they forgot. Yeah. No, no, but they had the lobs on, and, and that's so amazing because that's what gives the film, when you watch it, this quality yeah. of dialogue, like scenes. Like you're really watching a lot of scenes yeah. a play yeah. out between Just people. Playing out, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to have that yeah. feeling wow. without without mics no. being people being mic'd. And also like, just, yeah. just to think about how archaic docs could be. Well, docs still have a tradition of not just talking heads in the sense of interviewing these subjects. But having some fucking expert assholes on, right. you know, like, like uh, even if they're insightful, it's just like, oh god, kill me, you know, like um, nothing like that. It's just, uh, just be, fl- it's fly on the wall stuff, you know. Yeah, and to hear about the lavaliers, that just, I was wondering about that, you know, because um, uh, I was listening closely to how the sound was mixed. It was mixed very well, mm-hmm. and 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 the subtle way, because it's uh, the, the. What am I trying to say? I'm stumbling here. The sound was edited with uh, the finesse. And craftsmanship that you see in the, the film's editing, you know what I mean? Yeah. They really cared about uh, the uh, the sound edit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Marcus, you absolutely. Have I'm like just like every single subject. I just like ready to pounce on and like I'm just exploding, wanting to talk about every little detail that uh, of the craft that we're talking about because it's like I know it is really incredible. I, one thing I, I was thinking like when I was watching it was, um, you know, there is a, a really uh, it's. There's a really interesting mix of verite and like sort of artifice, and I think they do it really comfortably in this movie in a way that's like kind of sneaky and really well done. It's like it's not quite Wiseman where they're like just shoot like one no, camera rolling. I mean, there's I like yeah. sometimes I'm like, are there three cameras? There's a girl on the phone talking to her mom, and we see it from three different angles, and I'm like. Okay, did they re did they reset and have her mm. call her mom again? Did they have three cameras going? Of, did they, I think they have a know, lot of like, coverage. Most of the scenes in the that, movie have at least two shots, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there's definitely times where they just were they set it up and they're like, "Hey, you're gonna walk by this Ferris wheel, go over the fence, you know, right. help her yeah, down." Totally. And it, but it feels really natural, and like, you're gonna roller skate down this hallway. All this stuff feels mm. natural, but you know. If you've ever been on a production, that that would take a while to set up, you yeah. know, and, and have it <laughs> yeah. look good. And yeah. so uh, I don't. I thought it was a really cool blend of uh, of just like feeling verite, but actually just like a lot of just filmmaking craft. And, it's not. You know, um, it's not verite. Oh. Yeah, I. It, it's 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 not verite. It's a little it's, different. It's, 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 it's a little Sweden, you know. Well, it's 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 more like you know because he's not. There's not really many handheld shots <clears throat> where you're going from one thing to the next. I mean, just the really, fight in front of the bus. Sure. Like just to, to point to point out uh, the distinction where that is a very uh, grabbed, stolen shot. You know, where it's like the, sure. the lighting isn't great because it's like at night. Like they weren't planning on it that a fight would break out in front of the bus. You know, where they stop traffic in that scene. Right. You know, right. everybody here has seen this film a lot. Yeah, yeah. But um, but, it, but, w- w- but what they also do is is it's there's a lot of static you know tripod shots and a lot of it is lining up that perfect composition and i tend to think Mm -hmm. like someone like herzog who approaches documentary in a completely different way which is like the idea is like you're still making a film we're still making a movie here we're not making a piece of news or a piece of verite we're crafting we're taking real life and crafting a film out of it with actors and this movie does that so well by creating dialogue scenes that feel very composed and uh very film-like Absolutely. And the, they, the camera's like following the conversations well, like when they're in the house yeah. with the mom talking about, yeah. I don't know, I was just watching it. I was like, it's it's flawlessly following the conversation, you know, but know. it feels very natural. It's um, also with the VO, they do that really beautifully because you'll have that verite conversation and then you'll see where they have, like, they've obviously asked the kids, what are your dreams? What are your hopes? And like yeah. each kid kind of has that, but then they do that beautiful VO over you know, B-roll. And then it, so it creates this, I don't know. It's like a, it's a kind of a texture that weaves in and out really. I got one thing on that. 
I got one thing on that. The one thing on that, because yeah, because there are because they did do audio only interviews with the kids, right? They did separate audio interviews with them, and that they rent they run over footage, which is beautiful. That's a beautiful way to approach making the film. But there are passages, and right in that beginning with Rat, you know, where where you see him at the train yard, and his VO starts coming in. It's total. You you know what you you know what it is? It's dirtbag Terrence Malick. It's dirtbag Malick is what I'm calling it. (laughs) That is actually, guys. No, you, 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 we laugh, but like, actually, this is yeah. a, a really groundbreaking film ex- to, in, in the sense of exactly what you're saying. Because mm-hmm. this is, we've even griped about this before, even the, personally, all four of us, um, uh, how tired it is. The post kids, you know, the film kids, right? That kind of like, um, uh, God, we called it all kinds of things, but like the gummo, gummonography. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, like, like. Uh, I don't know what we were talking about. We're talking, I think it was personally, not on the podcast. Well, it's like anyway, poverty. Yeah, poverty porn. Yeah, poverty porn. Yeah, it's just like, um, it's like white trash fetishizing. And right. it got, yeah. it's not right. as big now, but it got so huge. Right. Like even George Washington, uh, yes. which is yes. more lyrical, but totally. but but dirtbag. Um, Malik. just like you said, dirtbag days of heaven is uh, became <laughs> very common. But these guys did it a lot earlier elegantly yeah. yes. and with insight and and depth Authentic- authenticity yeah, exactly it's not crass yeah. and exploitative and exactly it's not a, it's not a fashion so fashion tumbler you know it's yes not, yeah thank no, you. I, I agree thank it's you. not yeah. it's not like exploitive of them you know it treats them with like a, you know a dignity it gives them like a really deep three-dimensional three dimensions of their character you know to those people it treats them in, and i i you know um i don't even think that you know it doesn't have to be like they don't make it sensationalized. They don't to. It doesn't have to be sensationalized to be shocking and, and yeah. engaging, you know. And this, I mean, these kids are just speaking, and like you're watching them, and it is like shocking to watch. But I feel like daily life people are we, we, much more heavy handed with it these days. Well, you know, you, you um, don't you don't see a lot of times in films in general. I feel like kids of that age, like the 13, 14, 15... <laughs> You don't see kids like treated like adults, you know, and, and, and that are that are given the proper respect as people and individuals. And I think that yeah, this movie that like this yes. movie really treats those characters as real people, you know, and I think that's what's so. But um, they also reveal themselves to to kind of be just 13 still. Well, of course. And that's <laughs> yeah. the heart. No, I know. I mean, I'm just saying the mix. Yeah. is That's the word I was going to use. That's what's so heartbreaking, because when like, you know, they don't it's not even that they have like a tough exterior. I think that's really not not the right way to look at it. Mm-hmm. It's um, they are hardened because you grow up really fast. It's, you know, it's trite to say that, but it's mm-hmm. true. And they're not like playing tough and they're soft inside. It's not that simple. Um, it's just that they're more they're hard, but they still are just kids. You know, like they want to have fun and they want to yeah. like, play with their friends and fall in love. Yeah, yeah, and, and fall have first love. love and stuff like that. Arcades. Yeah, <laughs> but they're like weird, uh, like destroyed uh, pre-adults, you know, um, not kids. It's uh, it's a mutation. But um, this is I already I'm seeing a problem here. It's like 39 minutes. <laughs> I know. And uh, this is I a very know. major film. I just want to say one thing for two seconds. I want to give a shout out to 80 Blocks from Tiffany's, which mm. is a great doc about South Bronx street gangs from 1979. And uh, it's, be- of course, before this film. But there's a lot of similarities of everything you're saying. So I'm recommending to everyone, including yeah. you guys. 80 blocks from Tiffany's okay. outstanding doc. Um, that is the only thing I can really think of that's similar it, from that era. I do like that doc too. Yeah, I, but awesome. I, I, again, I just think it's a relief that this one isn't like set in New York, you know, like yeah, it's so great. Sure. Right. Okay. You know, well, um, we want to talk a little bit about the, the place of the film, you know, like I don't really know, um, the Pacific Northwest. I've only gone a couple times for one dumb reason or another, and, uh, I don't have an opinion, but like, uh, I kept thinking of Kurt Cobain. Uh, not to be glib, but I was because, um, you know, he'd be like exactly their age. Right. And, you know, he's up in, was it Aberdeen? And I could yeah. see him. He ran away a lot. And he was from a broken homes and p- poverty. And uh, he dropped out of school. He basically had their narrative, but something stopped and probably music and having some interest in actually doing something constructive, you know what I mean? Probably got him s- steering differently a bit. But um, he's, anyway, it's just all his complaints him and Chris Novoselic about how hellish it was up there and how life sucking. And, and, you know, like, like, uh, you know, it just, I see it in this film and there's something about it. I can't put my finger, but let's talk yeah, about it a little it bit. It feels it's, a little like pre that cult, but it's definitely pre that stuff landing. And I feel that like, it's, that's one of the interesting things about it. Cause I feel like if, if it was New York, it would be, there would be like elements of like art and like punk, like tied or like yeah. hip hop or something tied Absolutely. into it, you know? And, and Los these, Angeles look, too. These kids are like, 
you know, one's wearing a Clash t-shirt. It's, I mean, I know we're going to get into this. It's like band, it's like band shirt porn. You know, yes. this, the, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know, the kids wearing a Clash t-shirt, Def Leppard, you know, Judas like Priest. They, they are. But this know, is yeah. hillbilly. I think I know where you're going with right, this. Right, that's like, what I'm saying. It's like, it's, it's like, it's, it's not right. really like, they're not driving the culture. They're sort of consuming exactly. the culture. So if it's know? like Orange County, it would be the germs and they're on the cutting edge and advancing the, the form, you know, but here it's, it's, well, that's what um, Cobain was saying. You know, it's like, it's redneck up there. Everything is delayed. Yeah, badly. We're I mean, seeing the get, void before. Yeah. It's but filled they're with, you know, with yeah, they get MT, yeah. They get MTV now. And I think this is a perfect time than any that for Tom's superficial interlude. And I'll keep this very brief. Let's all discuss it. So, okay. This is a tragic film and we're going to probably finish up with just raw dread. But I will say, my, my, it's two things. Fashion, um, Michael Jackson's Beat It video landed really hard, probably <laughs> within the time frame of this uh, film being shot. Um, and there's uh, uh, Evan and I independently picked up on the metal heads with fedoras look, yes, which is so did. good, which also is kind of like I have a, I go to a dojo and there's scarves. And yes. it's very, I, and I watched the Beat It video after the film <laughs> and they're all aping it. That's what it is. There's tons of scarves and there's hats, you know? Like uh, like the gang leader in Beat It has like a hat. So that's and oh and also just uh, playing video games with two leather gloves. Yeah, that's a, of course. That looks <laughs> finger, smashes. Fingerless leather gloves. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. And then the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, and we're going to actually put this on YouTube for everybody. Um, I'm calling it Boombox '83, and just to hear what they're all rocking on their boomboxes, it's all like uh, uh, um, electro pop. You know, they probably loved you rhythmics, by the way. And listen, mm-hmm. I am just a little younger than a lot of these kids at the time. And um, I remember all the dirt bags would do Iron Maiden, but then they'd listen to Burning Down the House and um, right. and Eurythmics, just the one Eurythmics song, like uh, Sweet Dreams are made of these. Oh, so amazing. like um, we're going to make a mix because those songs are so bananas in like uh, it's a, it's a fr- freezing of a brief weird moment when yeah. um, in, in Hillbilly Town, a Hillbilly Town like this. Uh, MTV broke really hard with like like a new look and fashion and um, and yeah that's where you get like a Clash T-shirt uh, with an Iron Maiden you know uh, jacket satin right. jacket, jacket. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. yeah it's t- like a straight to hell uh, well, it's really cool how the music is woven through it you know and just yeah. feels like diegetic or what you know um, oh yeah and, it feels urgent uh, like you're on the street with everybody yeah, yeah. It's Spandau you know, it's Ballet a, it's the soundtrack of 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 that environment you know so it's the that's, sound of my soul <laughs> so that's my tom superficial interlude well, let's get back can I, well can cat. i say something about fashion no, I mean, real quick you guys, you want to. this 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 weaves this i have one fashion element to get into and it weaves into a personal detail with this movie is okay so what's the main kid's name is his name rat i can't rat, remember rat, rat, yeah. so he's got the shirt on that says um i i'm in i'm number three uh I don't try at all. I think that's what the shirt says. And it's got this kind of like big nice. nose cartoon character on it. And I was, they kept talking about Pike's Place. My best friend growing up, his dad was a cartoonist hmm. that had a stand in Pike's Uh-oh. Place market. And he drew those big kind of big no. nose, like fabulous oh, freak brother uh, shirts. Yeah. So this is just one of those things where like, I don't know if oh, it's wow. true, but I'm going to go ahead and say that. I think that was my friend's dad's shirt or something because it just feels too tied in together. And weirdly, because my friend was in Texas and I grew up and uh, when I moved to Montana, we went to Seattle when I was like 12. I went to Pike's Place Market and I found his dad at that stand and I said, hey, I'm your son's best friend or whatever. And he was kind of like, oh, okay. You know, he didn't, didn't really make a difference to him. But I swear that is the kind of like shirt that he Anyway, that was the one little uh, weirdo detail Love that it. I noticed. Rats T, man. All, well, all, all day tea. and every day. Rats T. <laughs> so now, uh, just to make a hard break, because we got out of the superficiality, or did you want to f- r- finish, put a button on the superficiality? I'm just going to put a button on this, and I'm going to throw it to Ramey here. <clears throat> so okay. just to what you guys were talking about, the Kurt Cobain thing, I mean, it was, de- it, okay. it was definitely leading into the plunge before the grunge, uh, so to speak. But um, <laughs> <clears throat> what, uh, what I wanted to talk about, because I know, Ramey, you, you and I chatted before this about and then we can wrap it up and start talking about some of the characters. It's just the yeah. kind of we we were talking about the setting and we're talking about you know Seattle, but it's also like the mood of the country too. I think there's mm-hmm. a big yeah, shift yeah. happening in culture. And Ramy, you were sort of talking about um, you know some of that, or we were talking about some of that. Oh well, yeah. It, actually, the introduction to this book is written by John Irving, the novelist. Wow. Um, I guess he was, oh. he was like a big fan of her work, but it's like interesting. Do you mind if I read a little, like a very short yeah. quote? Please. He wrote, 
Um, so he said, I saw the finished version of Martin Bell's movie not long after President Reagan had a landslide victory. I wish the president could see Streetwise, for there is little acknowledgement of the existence of Pike Street's children and his plans for America. At a time when so many of the self-righteous are crusading for the rights of the unborn, who is paying attention to the, to the born? Um, right. Streetwise is timely. I wish that the national fervor for fetuses could be slightly redirected. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's always, uh, you know, a great deal breaker for a Christian conservative, in my opinion, you know, about like uh, caring about the unborn. And, I mean, it's all it, that, too, is somewhat trite, but true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so many things that are trite. It's just like um, we care, we care, we care. Oh, they're born. Fuck you. Get out of here. Yeah. Like yeah. Less, what, less food stamps. <laughs> like what? Right, right, right. And I think <laughs> Reagan, like, yeah, cutting social programs, like all that right. stuff. That Government cheese. Got. And yeah, so it's like it's interesting because it's like hey, government cheese, you know, <laughs> yeah. this Velveeta, is, right? Uh, in pretty, it's like lesser Velveeta, you know. Which <laughs> doesn't sound fun. So can I? We're bleeding time okay. so bad. This is a nightmare. But um, I feel like we were talking. We mentioned the characters, kind of like maybe do portraits. But yeah. if I could just jump start it. Uh, by something that I feel very strongly about, and, and we'll open it up immediately to you guys too. Um, there was a term used called street couples, which yeah. really caught my ear. And it's very, uh, now we're getting into the total heartbreak zone here. Oh, yeah. But um, Let's do it. I, think, I think Rat talks about it. Rat talks about it somewhat practically. Well, someone mentioned street couples, and then Rat talks about the practicality like, you don't go out with alone, you know, go out with somebody. Yeah. Right? Or are you going to bing bong bang, you know? Yeah, you got to have like a, you got to have like a, a guy who's twice your age. With like a biker beer you know, that Rick, showers Rick with Rubin, you, like yeah. a Rick Rubin <laughs> yeah. cake. I always think of Rick Rubin. Um, totally. But anyway, so, so uh, I love that guy, and I'm so glad he never says anything in the whole film. He never so, said. No, I was going to say yeah. that was amazing. No, but 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 it's so, like okay, so American movie. But that's you know, Rat is a very practical dude, and by the way, he's doing he's flourishing now. By the way, he's one of the few people who came out yeah. of this mm -hmm. side. He's got like grandkids now. But um. Yeah. What I was going to say, though, just to open it up to the, to get to the nitty gritty of the characters. So um, uh, one of the th two of the three principles, I'm just opening up to you guys, is Tiny, who we talked about, and then Rad, we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And um, they, 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 they pair up at some point as the shooting goes on. And um, they're a street couple. And there's a bunch of street couples in the film. And um, those really break my heart because um, mm -hmm. the romances are, they can't have a relationship under these heavy circumstances. The girls are turning tricks. Uh, there's a lot of drugs involved, you know, just you know, going on and on and on. It's just such a dysfunctional place, but they still crave love, you know, um, and, and like, and what you're observing very perfectly, they're only 13 mostly, and they, they wanna have young love, and it's just so crushed by yeah. the worst of reality, but they still try to bond. And th this is one of the few scenes in any movie that's ever gotten me verklempt, no, shut up, is in the street couple scene towards the end, it's Rat and, um, uh, Rat is telling uh, 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 Tiny, like, yeah, I'm going to get out of here. And he's being kind of cold and teasing her. Like, yeah, I don't think we'll pick you up. We'll just fucking split, go to Alaska or whatever. Yeah. And she starts oh, crying horrible. and a lot. He's like, what? what's going on? Like dumb guy stuff. And But he means it. And then she just says this line that always kills me, which is like, oh, what is it? <laughs> it's like, um, you should have uh, figured it out already. You should have figured it out already. She's crying. But oh, then they do hug and it's very heavy. And it's, it's one of the most beautiful scenes of, of, uh, of depiction of love in a film. Ever, ever. Forget all the context, because that is just love right there from two people who don't have it. Tom, can I say something? Anywhere else. Sorry? I, I just need to respond to you about this. No, I'm done. I, yeah. like, literally, right, right before we hopped on, I am in tears. Like, I almost couldn't do the show. There you go. Like, yeah. I'm not kidding. And every time I watch this movie, that scene affects me in the same. And when Evan was like, "Oh, we're gonna do street streetwise," I was like, <laughs> "Like I just I was like even psyching myself up for that moment because I literally I, I crumble. Yeah, like I it's heavy. like her her on that bed and everything yeah. is on her face. Everything yep. that is breaking her heart. Everything that has let her down. Everyone's yeah. sadness in the film. Everyone's yeah. sadness. It's just yeah. right in the face. Yeah. And no. in that yeah. moment of just looking up and him be like, what's the matter? And he's joking. And she's just like, you should have fucking figured it out. Like, you know, and like, you know, that feeling like where you just like, you need someone to hear you and listen and, and no one's there. Goosebumps. And it's like, just, just stop. Stop teasing. Like Stop I, teasing. I need you. I need I this. Need, I need and you need this too, Rat. Because he's yeah. he's a guy and he's got the harder 
shell kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, that's that's a really powerful but scene. If and, I can, uh, if I can throw in on that scene, if I can oh, quickly throw in that scene, it. is you hate it, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> kidding. Okay. Brilliant, brilliant choice by, uh, of course, the editor and just the filmmakers too. Uh, when that devastating scene plays out. And, and then we cut to that shot of Rat looking at the boat or the barge or whatever off the distance, mm. and it holds mm. on him, and then he turns around right at the camera, and he looks right at the camera. And he ha- mm. and I'm sure this was shot at a different time, but of course, it just it goes yeah, back yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. whatever. We're, we're making a film here, and we got to make it work, right? Being creative with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. that expression on his face almost reads so much of like, yeah, so what? Like, you know, like, she's not going to get to me. Like, fuck you. You know, and it, it, yeah. it just works yeah. so perfectly with that moment but then unless marcus you have a feeling on that scene it goes to the most devastating shit in the world hey i was just gonna say i feel like that let's get into dwayne's funeral the editing tees that up so well because you it's about like love this is what people need this is what people want and then you're gonna see the end result of someone that doesn't have it such a one-two punch it's devastating let's just let's just quickly before we get to that just talk about Dwayne as being you know one of these amazing characters in the film I mean Dwayne Dwayne time big time he's such a a lovable character in this movie when you see him and um, you know I think the film captures you know his struggle so well um, and his idiosyncratic behavior as well yeah. <laughs> from time to time. It captures it so beautifully. you know. And that is one thing about this movie I just want to say too is that we do talk about this on other shows. you know. And, we, uh, and I've kind of haven't hit the nail on the head with it, but it's, the, it's almost what I can, for lack of a better term, calling it more, more of a Mike Judge quality. You know, like Mike Judge oh, okay. is such an expert of being so perceptive with people's idiosyncrasies. You know, and this, and, and, and whoever's manning the camera, Martin Bell on this is also perfectly finding those moments with every character that captures everything about them without you know saying anything it's just the, the quirks yeah. of these people right and he's Show don't um, tell dog exactly mm-hmm. and he's and he's captured so well but what i really want to say is the scene you have to talk about it where he is talking to his dad behind bars yeah is oh. maybe the most insane thing ever captured on film <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't, because I have a fucking deadbeat dad kind of thing. Not like that, but it just, that actually gets me personally a little bit like nothing's because that's well, like, oh God, I was going to get into this whole pretentious thing about like the cycle of, um, uh, you know, um, um, God is dead. And when God dies, like what replaces it and nothing replaces it, you're here basically. But I was going to say that, um, when you have no father figure or I'll just say parental figure or even family figure that has any kind of uh, inspirational, like yeah. th- I want to be like them, or more importantly, I want to make them proud. You don't have any kind of uh, grounding like that. I mean, hey, okay, maybe you don't need it, but I think you do, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And him having a negative example yeah. of, of, of his uh, you know, paternal figure, and um, that guy is right out of central casting. Oh. Like, he's such an archetype. Of like, he looks, uh, like, like, he looks like John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> yeah, kind of. John's cuter, but like, no, but like, um, I'm kidding. I'm watching a documentary too. I, but uh, can I, no, just last thing to say is it, it starts with that uh, Will, uh, Willie Loman death of a salesman. I'm done. There's Willie Loman death of a salesman. Like, so I got something going on where if I get out and then I sell uh, books back to the library or whatever he's saying, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that's all done. It's. I, I think it's what you said so interesting. So I, I feel like he, you know he still does in some way like look up to his dad. He's trying to can make connections with his dad. Like, hey, yes. uh, one, of the, one of the he's like uh, one of the jokers in the cell with you. He's like, tell him oh, I said yeah. hello. Yeah, you know, he's yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. he's like kind of yeah. bond. They are weirdly. He's kind of like trying to weirdly bond with his like felon dad on. I don't see that. that level. I, I mean, like that. I didn't see it. Well, the fact I, is that his dad is not there for him. Like, 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 and it, it is heartbreaking because it's like, there is that, like, they're, they're trying, but it's every step of the way in this film, you see like the young girl in the beginning who was one of the prostitutes was saying like, my mom doesn't care. And if she doesn't care, I don't care. Like, and it yep. shows like that, that detrimental, devastating effect when like, uh, when a kid actually like innately, viscerally feels that that person is not there for them. You know, like words can yeah. Words abandonment. Can, yeah, I, I think it's not entirely. Well, the thing clear is, the kids see the dad is like, um, like him. The, that dad feels like he might even be performing for the camera too. Like, 
I got to be rough on you, kid, you right. know, but that's, you know, you're Maybe. smart yeah. like me. You know, it's it's unclear if yeah. he's like manipulating yeah, that's a good point, actually. the performance, mm-hmm. of, you know, yeah. for the Yeah, because it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hollow. No, but yeah. I think, you know, the kid's doing the math. I, I didn't see any feeling from the kid towards his father at all. Actually, I looked very closely and I didn't see any. But like, um, what it, what it is, is the kid's doing some simple math here is just you cared more about fast bucks yeah, exactly. than me. Yeah, that's and, devastating. And, and, that's it? That's, and, also, and there's nothing he could say that would change that. It's no. like, I would rather scam and make a f- couple grand, you know, on the side real quick in one night or whatever he did to right. get arrested in, in jail. And instead yeah. of wait, full stop, yeah. I have a child. Um, I'm going to work at Quickie Mart, you know, like, but also, he's, he's seen, that, you, know, like you know, you know, that. you that's know, he, your dad prioritized that over your safety. Exactly. And, but he's and, also and in the like, pudding. But he's also totally a, yeah. a pathetic loser because he's also like a failed arsonist. Isn't that what his? Uh, <laughs> I think so. I think, I, I think you're right. I think I think that's what it is. A failed arsonist. Yeah, I think you're right. Oh my it's like god. Even, it's like even it's like even more tragic that like he like couldn't quite set something on fire. I don't know. <laughs> I'm um, gonna start yeah. crying, guys. Can we wrap oh. this up? I can't. Okay, okay. I can't take Dude. it. Like, there's uh, too many feelings in this movie. I can't. Do I know, it. Tom. I, I really, or you guys talk. I can't. I can't handle it. Because like, it's like intense. we're talking about Dwayne and. You see him and he's fucking, let's get into that. Like you see his funeral. Oh, no one shows up. Just some of the, the social workers right. and this dad with yeah. correctional correctional officers. And his dad brings a Coke. I was going to say, must mean, okay, must hold mean on something. I mean, Full stop. I'll give him a break. It, it may be me. I know I can't. Full no, stop. Yeah. The most, the, the most devastating shot of where everything collides into emotional overload, dark bleakness. What the fuck <laughs> is that shot? When he puts the goddamn coke on his fucking son's casket, <laughs> I know, is yeah. uh, like, oh, he just, I'm gonna put the coke up here on your casket. That yeah, just is, hold on a second, right? It's it's almost like Peter Griffith. Yeah, yeah you know, like Family Guy. Or something, yeah, it's you know. just so. Yeah. It's like he gets he gets leave to go to his kid's funeral, and he's like, can we stop and get a coke? Oh. <laughs> well, actually, can I can I take a poll really quickly with all you guys? You know, um, I didn't know what to think of that, and I thought, and now I'm gonna start crying mm-hmm. because. Um, I think may part of me thinks that what it is, it's a it was an old bonding thing. Like, hey, Dwayne always loved a Coke, and we used Ooh. to like drink a Coke. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah like probably. we used to always. So it may, I think it's actually that. Okay, that's yeah. that's, that that's very sense. hopeful. Yeah. That's a very up that glass half uh, full yeah, view of that. I think it is. I think it is. I think the dad, like you know, I'm sure I'm sure he was feeling something at that moment. I yeah. was exactly. blaming he himself. Was. So you, got it, you know, yeah. like, no, and, he, yeah. and they probably bonded and had like. Cokes and watched the Gong Show or something. You know, yeah, on Saturdays. You know, the thing. <laughs> and I, I can't take this. Okay, let's um, talk about the beta oh, video again. We, we, with a, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I know it's, it's really it's, it's all within the last like six out. minutes too right <laughs> that that all that shit goes down in like the last like six or seven yeah minutes. And it just it just like all crashes over you and I, it just, can't. I can't Ramey, I know movie. what you're gonna say Rami I know what you're gonna say let me set it up the 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 I film I just have a feeling maybe <laughs> no, I, maybe okay. I'm wrong but tell me if I'm okay. wrong is the bleakness and the darkness and the death does not end at the final frame of the movie it continues post script oh. uh, with another character in the film who uh, uh Remy take it away are we doing this oh, are we doing where are they now you're talking about gary uh gary ridgeway yeah we're we doing do where it. are they now no no oh god um, oh. Wait, green river can, can i say can i say oh. one green river killer very significant but can i say one thing about Dwayne's funeral quickly please yeah please, please, very please. quickly Sorry. so so mary ellen mark in the forward to this book also said that the kids love this movie right when it's screened mm-hmm. they she said they embraced it they felt like this is our movie the one criticism they had was the Dwayne funeral because wow. the they, because they actually, actually did go <laughs> well right and they didn't know so the, but the kids actually filmed it's like planned a memorial and had a memorial like a- a bal- yeah. I, I read it was a uh, releasing balloons. Yeah, and they did it like I hey, think. Hey, good was- point. Yeah, yeah, I read that too. I didn't yeah. think of that, but like, um, it does make it seem like because I wondered, like, not one of those kids went. You know. Yeah, so like, it was in even- a part break. Yeah, it feels and like so, the, so, who are your real friends? The, you don't have I think they, were, they kind of were like the kids were like, yeah, that's not exactly honest because they ah. were like, we we fucking love this person. They didn't go to that event, but they did honor him. 
Yeah, and fuck they had the a dad. ceremony. Cause, cause, and that makes event. sense, though. Be, that makes sense because they they live outside of the. Yeah, they did it on the street. I, I, right, yeah. they're, they're they're on the margins, and they did it the way Dwayne would want. Them they to do, do. Yeah, they they and, do things. You know hard, what I mean? Yeah. So they did it in a yeah, park. That thank they you. Obviously, Thanks for saying that. Yeah, because um, because everything's happening so fast emotionally. But in yeah. the back of my mind, I was like, funeral. What? Where's anybody? Like, come on, anybody? Like, any, yeah. Like I thought Rat and him were pretty cool. You know, exactly. And like, um, it makes the audience thought, think that. Yeah, and then it just makes it think like, uh, oh, he's dead, like shrug. Right, like, yeah. Exactly. Radio clash, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, because that was bad. And that yeah, leaves on a weird note, and I can see them, I could see them um, being affected by it. But we're going to do what I dreaded. I was watching this again today, and I went, I'm not going to look this up. Where are they now? <laughs> oh, no. But I had to look up okay. some other yeah. facts, yes. and it kept coming yes. up on Google. And then I kept seeing yes. uh, uh, the Green River Killer photo, and I was like, oh, Jesus yes. Christ. And then I went and did them all. So it's the blonde girl, Roberta, who's Roberta like Joseph Hayes. Yeah, who's fourteen, and she was warning the girl who is just about to become a sex worker that the black pimp guy will do one, two, three, four, five to you, and is bad. And then the other shithead pimp is like, "Yeah, it'll take it from me, but like, uh, I'm not saying." Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna be rich. You're gonna be rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. He's re- he's really scary. Really, the, like greaseball guy. But anyway, she, the blonde girl who seemed like, you know, a sweet kid and like yeah. really young and everything. And yeah. as she's going through hell, 1991, she is one of like, she's the 44th victim. Yeah. That piece of shit. Uh, uh, Ridge, what, what's his Those, name? Ridgeway? Uh, yeah, Gary. Uh, Gary Ridgeway. Um, yeah. And, you know, you think about actually, as I was watching, I was like, I mean, in my mind, it was like Kurt Cobain underneath the bridge and, and like uh, it's raining all the time. And then I immediately went like, and all those serial killers. And uh, I didn't even think God. think that one of those girls was killed, you know? That's Holy. so weird, like, when there's, like, people pop up in different, you know, times know. and places right. and contexts. Like, Timelines. Like, he didn't know, like, like oh, you're Streetwise. Small. I saw Streetwise. Like, <laughs> right. But um, there's a lot more death, though, uh, not to sound glib, but just it's true. Um, uh, um, the, 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 the pimp guy, right, who um, is, is having a jovial argument with the uh, preacher man on the street, Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I he love was that shot scene. to death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. such a great scene. I love who that guy. Who was shot to death? Man. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the guy who's arguing with the preacher oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the, the same guy kid. whose mom shows up too, right? Right. Yeah. Like, like, uh, like, he, like, he, like what did you he eat today? Melts. Cookies. <laughs> yeah. He turns into a little kid almost, and he yeah, can't look at her. He can't look her in the eye. He kind of looks at the eye. Looks at the camera, kind of ashamed. You know, it's amazing. He was shot to death. A few years oh. ago, oh. Yeah. and yeah. Um, the girl who um, answers the door for the uh, uh, the social worker and says, "Like we could have shot you, we're going to shoot yeah. you next time." She's yeah. being silly, but um, she died of AIDS in the nineties. Oh. oh my god, no! Oh, you guys, okay, yeah. There's I didn't know a few, that. Um, and then and then Lulu. So Lulu, oh Lulu, Lulu, Lulu she, the, the baseball cap wearing. Yeah, um, she was. Kind. She was a big deal because she was everyone says that she was kind of like their favorite like she was the protector of everyone Den mother like maybe. mama she bear she was yeah. totally yeah, exactly. the mama bear she stood up for everyone she would like fight the cops well you see it in the she, movie totally you know, she <laughs> fucks that she's awesome up, I fuck right her she's like apologize okay good <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you apologize. Pop, it's like, here's one for pop. on the way out. He, I know. So it's it's like telling a, a story about her beating somebody up later in the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how she got fucking, uh, you know, she'd get clowned all the time. She's like top and bottom. Uh, bone right. structure, yeah. my bone structure smashed and like, like one job. Um, yeah. She was out right. like she she was gay. Like she was out sure. being gay. And um, she ended up. Um, being knifed by a guy on the street because she was trying to defend her boyfriend. Because she was oh. doing mm. her girlfriend. Her girlfriend, yeah. yeah. Because she was doing that thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh. like one time at bitter. Sort of a guardian right. angel, yeah. Yeah, yeah that and sucks. Had, I also that sucks. read that She's cool. her, her last words were tell, like, tell Mary Ellen and Martin that Lulu died. Yeah. Like, in like 1983 wow. or whatever it was. Yeah, like literally that was like her last words. Cause like- Yes, you, that's what you, I read too. You, right, like, cause these people, like it was like a big, they let, you know- It became a family be, probably more yeah, than it, it would have been it if did. it was just this, cause I don't know how street life works, but like, I don't know if people bond for life exactly because their lives are so uh, hectic and transient. But I think because of the film at the least, these people have this lifelong um, bond. Yeah. Uh, sure, actually, I read and I didn't look at it yet. It sounds like a weekend's work. Um, there's a killer Facebook group where they've tracked down almost everybody who's alive in the wow. film, wow. and they're just chatting and throwing pictures and stuff. So oh, shit's on Facebook, really? oh, like streetwise God. group or whatever. 
and um, and they're still in touch, uh, those who can, you know. And I think that um, I think that Tiny has a lot to do with that. And I guess Tiny, you know, Tiny blew up kind of. Um, she's on the cover of the book, and um, she <laughs> she was definitely still hard into drugs for like twenty more years. Yeah, yeah. And she had ten kids, ten, ten different kids. kids, that kind of thing. Yeah. Ten kids. No, no exaggeration. Wow. But then she cleaned up her act, from what I've heard, and there was um, there was a semi sequel. It was about yeah. her. Yeah, uh, and like the 2010s or whatever, and I, I didn't see it. But yeah. so she's hanging in there. She's, I think she's flourishing. And yeah, did I say this on the podcast? But like Rat is flourishing. Yeah. Um, all I know yeah. is that like he has a family, and now he has grandkids, and he looks like um, like he waxes surfboards. Or something. Yeah. Well, no, he's a he's a tow truck guy or something, but he has very his own Cali. business. He has his own business, he's very, and and, he, and he's very he, uh, sublime <laughs> listening, Cali. <dude>. <laughs> <laughs> And he, and he, he has his own business, uh, and it was interesting. There's actually a special feature on the on the Criterion channel. You can watch it where they did a little piece mm-hmm. on him now watching the footage from the film. It's really kind of fascinating because he goes back and watches oh, those scenes. Yeah, and he talks about it, and he's like, man, I was a dick to her in that scene, like, you know, and oh, shit, you know. And he talks about hey, that. Know, wow. But he, that had, he was... Oh, wow. I was just going to say, he was in and out of jail a lot after this movie. He he was a car thief, and he was right. doing crazy shit for years after. And he got his act. He got his he act. He was a pro it. hustler scammer, yeah. Can, yeah. can you know, maybe just to dovetail for the moments that we have, uh, at that point that you're talking about Rat, who's so great, um, the way they open the film, just to get back to the filmmaking mm. with Rat's portrayal, he looks so cool and great. The way he's filmed, the lighting is insane. And it's just like, please use that picture for this podcast. Um thumbnail when he's yeah. looking first at the shot. camera he's first, just like yeah first shot yeah. of rat um and but then just all, there's such poetry it comes on so strong because you know it's all you're going to be living in that disgusting street for most of the film but like it's so beautiful and and his great line about like you're, you're diving you're in the water you're flying in a way mm-hmm. but then it sucks because the only thing bad about it is you come crashing down and it's just gorgeous stuff yeah, and it is it's yeah. a great quote it's so yeah. well filmed and that's just so lyrical yeah. And they get away with it. It's not. It's not doing something poetic is tough, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like they, they totally nail it, and 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 it's authentic, and they get away with it. Well, and um, mm-hmm. it's just yeah. every stroke is so masterful. Yeah. And I think just my last thought, maybe in this whole podcast, is just that moment is in the face of all that crass Larry Clark horseshit and like gummo and like it's just so so tacky. And and this film has such it's so not classy, yeah. but it's just got such heart. It's weird. You know, it's like the seventies really was cool. a little bit better at doing that poetic, lyrical stuff that you're talking about, and then it seems like people lost the ability to do oh, yeah. that later on. So it's like this is everything like in between. Yeah. 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 Or a gross out, and I'll keep mentioning Gummo. You know, it's about like yeah, Rednecks <laughs> arm wrestling. And drink, I was you know, thinking like, about like how right, right like, down shut up. I was thinking about rats uh, in 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 um, um in a uh, uh, voyeurism. Right, yeah. he exploited it. I mean, it's like I was thinking about kids it. this too, and I and I, which I despise, and um, like, and just thinking about how uh, Rat sort of the way that he speaks mm. was probably may, might have been the you know inspiration for how that guy speaks oh, in kids, like you Kelly know? Oh, yeah, you they know. he rewound you know a v- beat up VHS copy of Streetwise <laughs> when he's making the fucking movie. totally. Also, uh, but then again, then again, he did Tulsa, you know, like ten years before. You know, he did a photo essay on right. dirtbag kids. Totally. Who very Clark. Exactly. So, yeah. It's so, I mean, it's like, it is. Yeah. 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 But if it's also on that same point with like influences, there's also the Gus Van Sant thing. Yeah. Which is, which is interesting when, when we talk Pacific Northwest. About Pacific Northwest and, and street hustlers. Like, right. my own when, private when, Idaho. When you look yeah. at my own private Idaho, you're like, yeah, totally. this, is, this is streetwise mixed with City of Night, which is a, a, a book that it's also based on. Oh, Mi- yeah. You know. so well, and Shakespeare. It, and right. Richard III. But yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it is really, you look at that and you're like, yeah, how could that exist really without streetwise? Streetwise is really influential. Oh, and you guys are right. Yeah. Like, beyond documentary immediately. It's a good point, mm-hmm. you know. Well, one, um, one, uh, but one no thing one I, touches it. One no thing one I just want to, one thing I want to praise uh, Streetwise for too, watching it. You know, I, I I've been working on making documentaries of my own for the past several years, and one thing I'm really marvel at with this movie is um, for something that has so many different threads and so many different characters, the structure of how this movie is put together is mm. really super masterful mm. uh, in terms of how they weave everything. Like obviously, you just mentioned that very poetic moment. That's the first thing we really see that really grabs our attention. Mm. <clears throat> and then we get this amazing like seven to eight minute little package of just setting up the people in that 
uh, in that mm. crossroads of Pike Street or whatever. And it's like there, there's nothing narratively pushing us through that moment, but we're just captivated by every little yeah. person we see and everything we see. And then, of course, just how we weave into the arcs of all the individual characters. I mean, I just can't imagine like trying to put that together on a fucking flatbed uh, after just being out there. Yeah, you know, like, for just, like um, plot it months. out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. Actually, yeah. one, one little Definitely. cute thing that I like was um, if we're talking about sort of the, the art the overarching structure is um, uh, other than the poetic opening after that um, with a uh, rat, you know, we go right to Dwayne on the street, you know, like yeah. interacting with uh, bumming on the streets, um, uh, spare changing. And, you know, uh, and it has that really weird busking song that I want to clean <laughs> yeah. copy of. Oh, like, hey, go down to the woods. And these days, <laughs> yeah. in the woods with Popeye, and look out, and it's going to get you. <laughs> what yeah. the hell is that guy? What is that song? Holy shit. The director I mean, goes so well with the Tom, Tom Teddy, Waits kind of vibe. Right. Right. Teddy no, but, but, oh, God, it's so good. But anyway, you see, um, you see Dwayne, just the, 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 the circle of the film is uh, Dwayne hustling uh, and, and that fucking song. And how does the film end? Dwayne has just passed. He's no longer mm-hmm. on the street, but all the other kids are on the street, and there's even some new faces. You know what yeah. I mean? And that fucking yeah. busker guy, like I didn't bother that with the Popeye day. And I, <laughs> like, oh. keep going. He's gonna keep going on. And on. Yeah. yeah. And but I knew I was gonna see. It's not I trite, think- but I knew I was gonna see some new faces. And you know, that's like that's just a really valid observation. It's just like uh, nothing is different from the beginning of this film to the end of this film. Yeah, just keeps on going. You just touched on a quick little little filmmaking thing, too. It's like sort of an unspoke, unsung, like, hero of the movie, too. And I know we talked about how everyone's been loved and, like, the the music and stuff, but they really paid attention to the sound design in this. And there's, like, one tell that gave away that how much, like, work they put into the sound design again. There's, like, a famous sound effect that plays. Baby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's that, I know. It's that Aaliyah baby sample. Marcus, this is why I love you, man. You're out of your fucking mind. Because I thought I wasn't even going to bother mentioning it. The baby, it's it's a British sound effects record, but it's been sampled by Perry Kingsley, hip hop. Uh, uh, Aaliyah sampled it, you know, that, that big song with the like, I'm going to miss somebody. Yeah. Well, it's a baby oh. sound. Yeah. Oh, it's in Delirious. And it's. And it's <laughs> yeah, and it's in this movie, and I went, oh, they looped in that British sound effects record that's everywhere. The baby, oh going my that, like, god, you that guys. cooing, like yeah, we didn't do it that is so sick. This guy is awesome because he oh. is right on the money. <laughs> he picked up on it too. <laughs> well, hang on, one thing so we fun. both, and you're right, it's a good example. Yeah. Well, one thing we also picked up on too was our Amazing. fedora wearing metalhead, <laughs> and uh, I'm not trying to yeah, compete with he that. And I independently. I'm not. And I flag hard fedora <laughs> metal. Well, I'm not. I'm not trying to compete with you guys. I just want to say, no, let's fine. just spend. Can we just? Can we just spend five minutes just talking about some of the little moments that made us laugh in this movie? Because there's so much darkness yeah. and sadness. I know it's tough. Um, I was about to like uh, I, run away from the podcast. Yeah. I, you almost left. You almost, I know you almost. Yeah. I I love guy ju- jumping on bed springs in the street. Mm-hmm. Y- 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 yes. You know what I'm talking about? Which is that? Is that the weird preacher man's bed? Because he's next to the bed when he's. Yeah, I think so. Oh, maybe. Yeah, it's like yeah maybe. Right. Some, like a prop or something. It's a prop. It's a prop. Yeah. I, I love that. Let me just get to my other one. Yep. Judas yep. Priest. Judas Priest guy uh, donating blood is maybe one of my favorite <laughs> oh, little. Oh, I know. No. Moments. And then like it's like yeah, you're supposed to be 18, but you know I got a fake ID and I was like, God, it's like. 14 year old blood doning it's yeah, and, and like drinking like mcdonald's um orange juice after it it's just it's so bleak yeah. reality you can, can buy really hair dye suck. so you can Real. go back to I your know. motel and watch star wars and, and oh bleach marcus that, Dude, that, that shot is amazing that's marcus? incredible marcus hotel yeah. tv lights yeah yeah and it's like that, on his eyes and it's just like empire strikes back so that fucking rules. is the best i i picked up on that too that was like okay Best moment, Empire Strikes Back face yeah. flicker while he's that got like really cool. all the fucking <laughs> yeah. like Beavis and Butthead face on while he's got his hair yeah. done. Yeah. He's oh. in a trance. Oh, yeah. And it's on it's on TV because Jedi is in the theaters. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Right. It rolled it's over so and that one wound up on channel oh, 700. I also yeah. love the perms, the Munchkin and Patty's perms. Like I love them. There kind of wasn't enough of them. She yeah. looks... She looks like she's six, 65 years old. And I'm yeah. not saying her, I'm not trying to make right. it cheap. It's just like um she has this I mean more maybe she has the soul of a grandma. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah I can thing. see that. There's something about I loved her actually and I thought she was really sassy and fun uh, when she's dealing with the um and you know what? I want to give a little shout out that no we didn't mention nobody ever mentions but the social workers who try. Yeah. Yes. So there really was do. someone there yes. was someone 
There was someone in my family uh, when I was younger who worked with uh, mentally disabled adults, and I would sometimes hang out with them. And uh, it was kind of weird, but like, uh, he, you know, people don't do that all the time. And he yep. did something that was so self-sacrificing and he, he thought it was valid and kind of no one else is going to do it. And I'm going to give a damn. And it's just really beautiful to see that. Right. Because yes. um, the guy with the hat, especially the old guy, yes. he, he cared. He cared. He cared about Dwayne. You know, this movie has mm-hmm. actually it's, it supposedly has inspired many people to become social. Wow. Players. I, bet. wow I believe it. I believe I it. Bet. Yeah. Um, and well, I, uh, I, I've, well, I've, it's inspired me. I'm like, I'm going to mm. do it. You're on, she's on the path right? to becoming a social worker. I'm to be a filmmaker. Oh, no kidding. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, nice. Wow. But like you did, you watch a movie. I want to get a fedora. That's all I want. <laughs> for my new look. <laughs> so we're all inspired, you know. All right, Marcus. Like, uh, Marcus. All the same. Uh, uh, the Marcus. one time they went, the one time they really go for a joke and it, and it totally lands uh, after the kids are swimming, uh, the love story between the two kids, you know, they mm-hmm. both have hickeys. Oh my and God. And she says, and, the, and they go for, she says like, oh, he's got such pretty eyes. I think they're brown or, or blue. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are those? She's like, what are, yeah, what that's are very, those? Adorable. Very, very adorable. adorable. Something like that that's um, good. It really what, is. Wait, did you guys know about, sorry, American Heart really quickly. Did you know about that? I just read about that today. Uh, it okay. looks terrible, I've but it's, it. yeah, I've, it's seen, um, I've seen it. Me either. But no, it suck? I, it's not. It's not hard. It's like you know. Okay. It's not hard. It's just. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's, it's like D- Dwayne is played by more or less Edward Eddie, Furlong, Eddie and Furlong. then um. Oh, um, no, it's it's a narrative. And Jeff Bridges of this is, film? Uh, is is that- Jeff Bridges looks nothing like um pencil thin mustache no. arsonist guy. <laughs> no. Freaking so coke. The, the so that doesn't work for me. Is if they made a movie of if the if the dad gets out of jail and yeah. meets up with Dwayne and they okay. have his life and that's the movie. Well, yeah, we have one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, while we have one minute left, I got to get my one yeah. fedora detail in, and I'm done with the fedoras. I'll put it away. Please. Is the so okay? My other little scene that's great, underrated scene in the movie is the carnival scene with fedora metalhead guy, where you know he's yeah, got yeah. the he's got the camo shorts, he's got the class shirt and the fedora hat, yeah. and you see these beautiful shots of the Ferris wheel and the, so well filmed. The different Some of the little best. yeah, like you know mm. whatever the car- carnival rides, but. It's it's got his yeah, yeah. you know voiceover narration of the most Beavis and Butthead, you know where he's like, oh, I like women, they're sweet, yeah, yeah. they care, and they need caring, you know, and it's just like yeah. it's amazing. I love that. For Dora yeah, Metalhead, he's great. the same dude. Does he say you ever heard of D and D? Far out. Yeah, yeah he's a lovable awesome. dumbbell. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't see his. Where are they now? You know. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, we're running out him. of time. How about selling little tiny pieces of a cigarette uh, pack as acid? <laughs> He's like, oh, I just yeah. make a little square out of the empty <laughs> cigarette pack, and I just made like a hundred bucks per pack. Yeah. Holy oh, shit. shit! That works. <laughs> Great. Just, it's those note. little moments, you know. <laughs> Great note to end on, um, <laughs> guys. We did a lot, though. We did a lot. We did. Okay. We, we could have done so much more too, but I mean, oh. God. I know. You're, I'm sure you're well, just. Well, we made Ramey. this stupid show called One Fucking Hour. <laughs> I know. I'm sure yeah. Ramey's just Our pouring fault. over your notes you didn't get to get to on the show. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Um, but uh, that was One Fucking Hour on Streetwise. Thanks so much, everybody. That was a lot of fun yeah. for such a. And look, if you haven't film. seen it, I hope you haven't listened to us because I, there's quote unquote spoilers, yeah. I guess. But um, highly recommend it. You know what? If you've seen it and you like it, if you haven't, if you haven't seen it in a long time, see it again. Tell people. It's just a very rewarding experience for anyone. It's an know. all-timer for me. I mean, it's it's up all-timer. there. I mean, it's yeah. it's one yeah. of the most kind oh. of remarkable things that uh, you know has has ever happened, been made. I think in a lot of ways. And that <laughs> I mean, Siskel and Ebert thing. He said he says it's like sort of like uh, what did he? How did he describe it? He said it was like shockingly good or like you know. He, he, I think it's really it's heavy hyper- hyperbole. Yeah. Although hyperbole is you know kind of a bad connotation, but. No, they were very enthusiastic, both of them. Um, it's probably one of the most enthused reviews they've done ever yeah. that I've ever seen. You know, just yeah. like beyond. And they were, they're like, one thing it's like, uh, I think uh, Gene says, like, when it was over and the credits rolled, I just sat there. Wow, you know? yeah. I think Roger yeah. said that. But, it's um, heartbreaking. Yes. I mean, it's, it's devastating. Yeah. Uh, devastating. We didn't talk about the pizza scam. Um, we'll figure oh. it out. Uh, well, you <laughs> maybe did mention the, Maybe that's the moment. Tom? Tom, you yes. did mention it at the end of last week's episode. So, oh, that's true. So if you want it, if you want Tom's pizza bit, it's pizza. on the end of our last episode. So, um, <laughs> which anyway. was Garden State. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. I want to add confusion. That, 
I know. Oh my god, it wasn't. It was uh, re- remember my name. Uh, another terrific film. I know. I know. Let's talk about next Great week's film. episode. Okay, uh, I'm very excited. Good. Up, I'm very fired up about this because this is believe it or not. After 26 episodes, our first hour on a film from the goddamn 1960s. Marcus, I know you're excited. Ridiculous. The fuck? Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's, right. that's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like slumming in the nineties. Uh, one from the sixties and twenty six from nineteen seventy four. Yeah, no, no, nineteen seventy eight was a huge year for us. No, but we're very nineties too. But yeah. um, yeah, yeah, the swimmer, <laughs> which is uh, also a bit of a deep cut. Um, we've been pretty enthusiastic about um, how "Remember My Name" went in the sense of a film that is a is really still a, 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 a real obscurity. Yeah. Uh, it's never been on any form of uh, video uh, home release, so that's part of the problem. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, uh, you know, once in a while we do big mambo hits, like our take on Texas Chainsaw Massacre or whatever. But um, I think more we're going to get into, like, some deeper cuts and gems. share with people. Yeah, gems. films. Yeah, like some totally. kind of hidden gems. And this is a very special film, a John Cheever short story. I'm rewatching Mad Men, and I'm very enthusiastic about t- covering The Swimmer. <laughs> Because um, it, it just, it echoes in, in a lot of ways, actually, uh, parts of at least the suburban life of Don Draper. And all yeah, that, and, and, you know, so, you know it's um, also getting into the filmography of Frank Perry, who's just a very fascinating kind of oh, under-discussed, you know, mm-hmm. filmmaker. And, and obviously, this movie oh, is so weird. Uh, and it it's is a weird. Very bizarre sort of story here about a guy who's swimming home. In a very surreal, obviously, then becomes yeah, nightmare. exactly. He's he's got an un, uh, he's got a an unorthodox method to get from point A to point B in his suburban yeah. neighborhood. Now, this this, this to, to speak to this, uh, it really is highly recommended more than ever because this is not you know Texas Chainsaw Magnolia. We were, you do recommend people do see the swimmer beforehand because mm-hmm. it's going to be spoilers are plenty. Kind of the, there's like a, a master spoiler, <laughs> you know, and yeah, yeah we're yeah. going to really, of course, be referencing that quite a bit. So um, yeah. maybe don't. We don't suggest that you uh, learn of the film through this podcast, but you know, try, try to watch it if you can. Swimmer's killer, man. Do we, is, it, is it on streaming somewhere, right? Somewhere? I, yeah, I'm pretty sure like, this is available anywhere, and obviously it's also on Blu-ray. Prime it's or it, some shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all okay, okay. So, so um, yeah, The Swimmer. It's 1960s the swimmer, movie. Yeah, 1960s. I think it's 68, uh, so it's tail end yeah. of the 60s there. But very excited to dig into it. Lots to talk about with that movie. Um, Joan Rivers so, is in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So mm-hmm. next week, everybody, one fucking hour on the swimmer uh but we can't let you guys go without your m- moment of zen so we'll have that we'll take it away and i know Remy, it's your favorite and uh, everybody have a great rest uh great rest of your weekend and uh we will talk to you guys soon thanks for joining us and good night next week bye bye everybody bye. How about the scene in the uh, prison with the, the father behind the glass? Where well, was a film, Paris, Texas, that we liked that in a similar scene with people behind glass, Natasha Kinski, right. another guy. This is just as good as that. You name the Hollywood movie, and I'll show you a scene in this film. It's better. Well, Streetwise won, uh, won an Academy Award nomination this year. It didn't win the Academy Award. But Harvey Milk beat it, and I'm telling you, this is better than Harvey Milk. It's one of the best films of 1985. It's now opening in theaters around the country. And I hope it gets a chance. You know, documentaries are often mm-hmm. just overlooked by people. They want to see a movie, so let's not go see a documentary. You're not going to see a fiction or a nonfiction film much stronger than Streetwise this year. Next is classic thumbs up for the teenage runaway documentary Streetwise. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. Mm-hmm.